Good afternoon, everyone. Um, a warm welcome, because it's quite chilly here where we sit. Um, thank you for joining us today. It's, it's really nice to see the numbers climbing. We've reached 150 within absolutely no time. Uh, as per usual, we'll just give it a few minutes to make sure that everyone is in attendance and everyone is nice and comfortable. Hopefully with something nice and warm to drink, like a cup of coffee or tea. I should have sorted myself out. I've only got icy cold water, but that will have to do this afternoon. At least I've got the aircon on. Um, we've got an incredible number of people that registered today with us. There's 740 in total. And I can tell you that we've got close to 250 psychologists, there's over 100 physiotherapists, 63 OTs, we've got 63 bios as well, there's 59 speech therapists and audiologists, we've got 41 dietitians, um, I think there's 16 podiatrists, we've got 29 medical orthotists and prosthetists as well, nine social workers, nine chiropractors, we've got a handful of doctors, I think there's six or seven doctors with us, and um, 36 optometrists, so a warm welcome to all of you. I just noticed there there's, should be 37 registered counselors who's joining us today as well. So please sit back, relax, make yourselves at home like Dr. Kunda is doing right there. Um, and please join in on the conversation. You will notice that there's either a chat functionality or the question and answer functionality. You can use either of them. We tend to prefer the question and answer one. Um, and do engage. It, it's, a, it's an open platform, a, a nice relaxed forum. Those of you who have, who have joined us before would absolutely know it's an informal discussion and we, have, we love hearing from you, the attendees. Um, for any new people that joined us this afternoon, just so that you know, all our previous webinars are available on our website. You can see it on screen. It is easymet.solutions. Just navigate to the webinar tab, go to the previous dates, the topics are there and the links to the webinars are there as well. And that's also the place where you can register for any of our future webinars. So we would love to see you in future with us as well. And all our webinars take place same time, same place, Thursday afternoons at four o'clock. Now, you might think that this is sort of a, a replay from two weeks ago because it's three very familiar faces on the screen. But um, it's not. Um, just because we had overwhelming response from our webinar two weeks ago with Dr. Quinda, we had such positive feedback. And I think the attendees were extremely engaged with the question and answer functionality or the chat functionality. We kind of asked them to come and join us again. So Dr. Quinda, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time out of your diary. Um, a lot of you may know that Dr. Quinda is the acting um, HPCSA Registrar and CEO, and he's also the HPCSA Ombudsman. But did you know that he's also a qualified family physician as well as a third level LLB student? Um, and just to top that, he's also a pastor in the ministry. And I know that calling lies really close to his heart. Um, Dr. Quinda, thanks again. I can carry on with your CV. It is very long, but I'll, I'll keep it there. Um, I don't think Dear, thank you. I don't think Dion Beers, the director of Profnet Medical, needs any introduction. He's a very familiar face here. Dion is also part of the executive of the SpaceNet Global Group, who's also sponsoring today's webinar with the support from, from EasyMed. Um, as you can imagine, this webinar is accredited for one CEU. And if you registered and logged on with that details, you can expect your certificate early next week via, via email. Now, as a product manager at the SpaceNet Global Group, I will be your host again this afternoon, and my name is Lani Ice. Welcome, sit back, relax, enjoy the session with us, and please engage via the question and answer um, functionality. We would appreciate that. Now, over the past couple of weeks, we've addressed numerous questions and requests around ethics and ethical billing. And... Um, there were, during our previous conversation with Dr. Quinda two weeks ago, there were a couple of questions that was left unanswered. So if I may, I think let's start by tackling those. We've sort of grouped them together under a topic. And then if there are any questions from the attendees, please, please post them and we'll definitely see whether we can get to them this afternoon. Now, Dr. Quinda, if I may start by asking you, healthcare practitioners' clinical notes, who does it belong to? And if a medical scheme requests to see those notes, can a healthcare practitioner share it? And should they get the patient's permission before they share those clinical notes? 
Yes, Lani. Uh, of course, answering this question, uh, I know the context uh, <laughs> uh, under which this question will be, and will be asked. And most of the times, and colleagues, I mean, I have to be honest with you, most of the times, while, while the reason why practitioners are not comfortable, and this question always come time and again, and we have addressed it as well, uh, as counsel, is because most of the time it's like really a practitioner thinking that I'm being audited for fraud and all those kind of things. And hence in answering it, of course, I'm not gonna be direct, but I think what we need to understand is that the tricky issue here is that the, the patient, and you call that person the patient to yourself as a health practitioner, has got two contracts that they've entered into. They've got a contract with you as a practitioner, and they also have got another contract with the medical scheme. Mm -hmm. now, now, these two contracts are, are regulated by different laws. Uh, the contract between the patient and the medical scheme, of course, is regulated in terms of the Medical Schemes Act, and the other contract with a health practitioner is regulated in terms of of course, you can start from the Constitution, you can come to the National Health Act, you can also talk about the Health Professions Act. Now, these contracts run concurrently, so when that patient is in front of you, they've got a contract with a scheme that, uh, that is funding for the services that you are rendering as a health practitioner. And in that contract with the scheme, uh, they, they give permission to, for the scheme as they contract when they sign to be a member of that particular scheme to have access to the records mm. uh, kept by a healthcare provider who is a health professional, of course, mm. registered with the HPCSA. And also they can also have access to the records kept by a managed healthcare organization. Now your question says, who do those clinical notes belong to? Uh, I can take you now to our guidelines so that you can understand who the clinical notes belongs to, is that although the clinical notes are made by the practitioner, they have to do with the patient. That's why if the patient want the copies of those clinical records, you are required to make those copies. And if they just want copies, you need to, you can charge them for making those copies and you keep the original. But if they want their clinical records original because they are fed up with you or they are tired of you, they want to go to somebody else, then according to our guidelines, you need to give them their original records if they want to go to another practitioner. But the question is, who do they belong to? They belong to the patient. Of course, you take those notes uh, for the patient so that you can treat the patient, but remember, one of the core ethical values or core ethical standards in terms of our booklet uh, number one is that whatever you do, you do it in the best interest of the patient. So even when you keep those notes that also assist you, let's be honest, if those notes, the patient is not there anymore, you have got nothing to do with those notes. Mm -hmm. But the patient will need those notes for the rest of their lives if there's anything significant, that, if they want to move on. That's why if they want to go to another practitioner, you will have to give them the notes because the other practitioner need to know what are you treating the patient for. So what I can say is that basically, although you keep uh, those records, you are just a custodian, but really uh, the, the information, and I'm talking about the information is about the patient and it belongs to that particular patient. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Dr. Quinn. Thanks. I wonder if I can uh, maybe just throw a span in the works. And uh, firstly, good afternoon to you, Dr. Kunda and Lani, and to you, all, our, all our attendees. Um, uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, I think the, 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 the issue around the, the signing, um, there was a question now from Dr. Watts is just saying, but I haven't signed an agreement with a medical scheme. And that's absolutely correct, unless you've signed a network arrangement or have entered into some sort of contractual arrangement with a scheme or an administrator. Um, then, then essentially the contract is between the practitioner and the patient. But the patient has got a contract with a medical scheme when they sign up um, to take out that specific medical scheme saying which policy or plan do they want. Um, and then debit orders are set up and then they're entitled to those benefits accordingly. Um, 
the challenge always is that, you know, they may have signed in those terms and conditions to say that the medical scheme is allowed to access my patient data or clinical information um, in order to validate certain uh, processing or payment of claims. And I think that's often in those terms and conditions um, that you are signing as a, a, a member of a medical scheme. But I think the, the challenge always, and I put myself in that position as obviously a consumer of healthcare myself, is that I, I may have joined a specific medical scheme, let's call it 13 years ago, and I signed that clause, not knowing what kind of health condition I might develop in the future, not knowing that I might have something that's quite sensitive that's diagnosed in me, and I don't want that to be disclosed. And I think the Consumer Protection Act, certainly, as well as the, the Poppy Act, would speak to permission for information to be shared for a specific purpose. Um, and and that isn't, that, that's almost a blanket permission at that point versus the specific purpose that is used for now, which might not be in the processing of my, of my claims, but trying to validate issues around fraudulent activity, for example, or using outcome measures to, to shape other benefit designs. So, so I think it's very important that we just uh, pause before engaging on that one and just glibly like leaning back and saying, but the patient has already signed um, permission for that information to be shared. So I think just looping that back, it's always the safest to, if the, if the information is belonging to the patient and there's a third party looking for it, whether it's a, a legal firm or whether it's a medical scheme or the Department of Health or an employer, is if it's the patient's information and you put copies in the patient's hands and say, if your employer wants it, then you go and give it to them. If your uh, uh, legal uh, uh, representative wants it, here you, are, here you go, you go and give that to them. Then you've distanced yourself, you sign that over that you've given that to the patient and then it's up to them how they manage their data. Um, and I think that is a, a degree of separation, ensuring that you're not bypassing the permission of the patient to actually hand it over to third parties. I, th I think, Dion, uh, th there are two things that you have mentioned. And I think one of them being that, that's why earlier on I said, all this is regulated by law. Yeah. And, and what you are bringing right now is that maybe as a practitioner, will I be okay if when they request to have access, then I say to the patient, your medical scheme want information about you. Here it is. Take it to them. Mm -hmm. I think at the end of the day, because the issue of access really, you know, how do schemes have access? Mm -hmm. They can have access by coming to your practice and ask to see the records about a particular patient and not take anything away. Mm -hmm. Or they may request that information. Yeah. And, and what you are saying, Dion, is maybe... In practice, one can, can use a mechanism where you say, hey, you know what, ne? I'm going to give this uh, whatever you need to your member. Yeah. <laughs> because as, as somebody asked a question, you, you don't have to be in contract no. uh, with, with a scheme. The, the contract is between a member and the scheme. You have got a contract with your patient. That's but right. you can say, okay, I will release the, the records, mm. but you're going to find them from your member. Yeah. And then you indicate to the member that please come and get your records, your scheme one the, the records. Yeah. All that is required is that don't prevent the scheme from having access. Mm -hmm. And how you do that, mm -hmm. and you are bringing something that I think that can be practiced where you say to the member, your scheme wants your records, here they are, you can, you can share them with them. Sure. I think that following this question it came up from a couple of webinars um, ago, I think it was three or four when we still had Neil Hopkins on the call. Um, and uh, the, the question was exactly along these lines. And I think the first, first a precautionary measure, um, just a, a due process is that um, the, your medical malpractice insurance provider, um, most of us as uh, allied healthcare professionals, and I think even the, the, the medical doctors, um, have got uh, claims made cover when it comes to the insurance for, for malpractice or negligent claims. Um, just, just to everybody listening in, I think it's very important that if you ever do have a request for those notes, there's usually a, a case that may prevail as a result of that. They're not just innocent requests. You need to notify your, uh, your, 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 your broker um, that there is a potential claim that might come up. Um, and then obviously also engage with your association and society for direction and guidance, as well as the HPCSA who's quite clear about these in, in some, some uh, very well-directed uh, documents on what to do in, in cases of uh, forensic reviews or clawbacks and those sorts of things. So, but what, what was interesting in that last conversation, spilling on that, is we actually took um, various legal advice to see what exactly is the position on the, the notes, the clinical notes. And um, there's, there's some views that state that while you're writing the notes, there's patient data, and then there's clinical interpretation of that patient data. 
and that the patient data, in other words, where I stay, what my symptoms are, what I'm feeling, that belongs to the patient. That's certainly their information. But as soon as I take that as a clinician and I start translating that and I start saying, well, I'm anticipating the following, uh, my plan of action on treatment is the following. Those are clinical notes that are my interpretations of those. And there is a legal view. There is a legal view to say, if those are separated, absolutely, the patient notes and information belong to the patient, but the clinical notes and the interpretation belong to myself. But we know that very often when I'm making notes as a clinician, that all sits in one file. So that does uh, uh, complicate. But I do know of one underwriter, uh, insurer, a, a, a mutual insurer, that in fact has advised their, um, their, their, their members um, that those notes belong to the practitioner and that they shouldn't relinquish those to any third parties um, uh, without a, the, the patient's information. And secondly, it could go through the legal channel, uh, channels of being subpoenaed for those in, that information. So I guess that's the other extreme. And I guess one also doesn't want to be obstructive in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's an interesting question that came in. And mm. we've asked, should patient notes be shared with medical schemes with or without um, the patient's um, um, permission? But the question is, should there be a complaint against you as a healthcare practitioner? And there's an inquiry committee at the HPCSA. And they are asking for an explanation from yourself as well as your clinical notes. Should you and can you share that clinical notes with the HPCSA? Okay, uh, Lani, maybe to, to start with what Dion said. <laughs> one of the things really that one has really picked up is that, and I saw one of the question, uh, a comment from a psychologist here, who is speaking in line with what Dion was saying, that you know, as a psychologist, you, you write certain things mm -hmm. about the patient for your records, that you wouldn't even want the patient himself or herself to see. Yeah. And it, it goes back, you know, to also the issue of informed consent, where you know in law, you can withhold certain information uh, from the patient if it is going to pose a risk or going to put the patient in danger if you disclose that information to them. So it's an issue really where I think... Uh, a debate is, is needed, uh, not only uh, unilateral from a health professional's point of view, but also to bring this to light in terms of the funders, because it's true. I mean, the, the psychologists deal with sensitive information that you wouldn't just want, even the patient. I mean, if we were to go the route of giving that information to the patient, yeah. I mean, I have seen it as ombudsmen where where people say things because they have access to the records, things that they are not supposed to see. So th those are realities that we need to, to really debate on. And, and I think, you know, with the relevant stakeholders and say, we have got this situation, uh, professions are not the same. That's why this mm -hmm. evening, I also asked our, our head of division for professional practice to be in attendance so that he can start this process so that there can be engagement <laughs> with, with everyone. And specifically to the question that you raised, uh, Lani, the, the issue is that, and we have done it very, very well now, in that when a person lodges a complaint, they also sign a consent form at the same time mm -hmm. so that that information can be disclosed. So usually we have already the consent form, even now online, because complainants can lodge a complaint online. I mean, if you try it yourself now, Yes, yeah. I'm speaking and you want to lodge a complaint online. There is a consent form there that when, when you submit that complaint, we also receive the consent form. So already we have the consent for disclosure of that information, which will be shared with you as a practitioner so that you can disclose the information without a study. Okay. Um, Lonnie, if I can bring in, there's a question there um, also relating to when I see a patient for the first time from a specific medical scheme, Yep. Um, I get a message that basically says this patient has given me permission to access their profile. Now, if I, if I understand the context of this, there is a specific scheme administrator that does have a clinical record system um, where patient notes or patient results and so on are shared across different practitioners um, so that you've got a centralized health record approach. So um, mm -hmm. I think in principle, we understand the, the, the approach. Um, but I think, uh, Manny, just to answer your question, that is usually where a patient is prompted either through an OTP, an SMS, an email, where they then authorize and say, I do hereby give uh, um, physiotherapist Dion Burr's permission to access my records. Um, 
at which per, which time you are able to then access in and then see a list of blood results, for example, so sure. that they're not repeated unnecessarily, and you've got coordinated care and not overlapping or, or, or unnecessary expenditure of those getting mm. results that are already there, right? So I think um, absolutely that does tie into this discussion, and it's important that the patient is involved in that, that they have given that permission. Um, I would most certainly in that case uh, just confirm with the patients, most certainly the first time, to say, have you, have you actually given consent to this? And what was the process for you to consent? Because you need to be sure that you're not part of a chain of, of data being moved from one entity to another without the patient's informed consent on that. And they must understand what data is going to be moved to, who is that going to be moved and for what purpose, and how long will that new recipient of that data have that information. I would really employ you to, to, to go look in, uh, at, the, at the POPI regulation. That I just want to remind everybody, those chapters affecting us have been promulgated and are fully enacted as of uh, 15 days ago, the 1st of July. We've got one year to comply. There's a grace period. But you really do need to rap, uh, move rapidly into ensuring your practices are properly compliant. You don't want to be in part of a chain where data has been shared from one party to the other where that hasn't been addressed sufficiently and appropriately. Perfect. Thanks, gentlemen. There's, there's, there's one other one that I might just be able to add on to that, Lani, also relating to a similar scenario. And that was asked in the previous webinar where um, it, it relates to telehealth. It might dovetail into your next question possibly. But... Um, in the telehealth space, there are some schemes that are actually asking um, that when you have a telehealth consultation, you actually have to submit what was initially clinical notes, almost a summary of what was done in that session. And I think that's now moved into a simpler form just to confirm that the, the, the session, in fact, did happen. And I think, again, there, I think there's been flex on that one because of pushback to say, but why am I disclosing patients' clinical information and my findings to validate the telehealth consultation? And I'm glad that there's been some pushback and most certainly a pause mm -hmm. from clinicians to say, hang on, I can't just send this on just, just willy-nilly. I need to understand why. I haven't informed the patient that I'm going to be sharing this on prior to actually doing a telehealth consultation. So hold on a second. I can't just disclose that to any third party without the right mm -hmm. permissions and processes. Yeah. Perfect. Th thanks for summarising that again, Dion. I just want to, Dion, look at you. Can we just rewind two steps? And you mentioned the difference between clinical notes and patient notes. If we can yeah. take that a step further, and let's picture a scenario where you as a healthcare practitioner are in the process of selling your practice. Uh, mm. Do you just sell the bricks and mortar of that practice? Yeah. Are you allowed? Is it ethical to sell patient notes or clinical mm. notes or both in that scenario? Wow. So, so we've got the, the ethical uh, guru. I don't think we can go higher up the chain than having Dr. Quinder here. So I'm going to leave a question to be answered by Dr. Quinder, if you don't mind. But I just want to frame the situation that we're often finding ourselves in just to elaborate on the problem statement. And the problem statement really is people come to us and say, I'm selling my practice. Help me. How do I evaluate my practice? How do I sell it? Can I sell it to you? Who can I sell it? What is the process of selling it? And in those conversations, when you start evaluating the practice using sort of accounting principles and you, you, you work out what the price earnings yield method evaluation is of the practice or whatever method you use, um, and that number comes out, there's often a, but hang on a second, I actually want a little bit more than that for my practice. Let's put some goodwill in. So there's already a bit of a challenge there when you have to sort of, sort of fish for goodwill. But I think there's elements of that. And then they throw in the winner and they say, but hang on, I'll also sell you my patient files. In other words, I'll leave the key to my patient cabinet. So when you come in the first day, you've got a cabinet full of files. When the patient comes in, you're able to draw that file, go in and carry on the treatment as usual. So we can try and justify that by saying, but this is continuity of patient care. It's not abandonment and all of those. So ensuring continuity of care, which I think is the one consideration. But what about the patient who steps in to that practice and goes, no, where's Lani? No, Dion, I'm Dion. I've taken over Lani's practice. I've bought it. And by the way, how's it going with your ingrown toenail? Um, that patient might turn around and say, how on earth do you know that I've never given permission for this information to be handed from Lonnie to you? So I'll, I'll pause there, but that, that is the scenario that we're finding and people are glibly saying, but I'll send you my patient files. How do we navigate that, Dr. Quinder? <laughs> As I was thinking, I'm thinking, when you, when, you buy, when you buy a house with tenants, what do you do? <laughs> 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 just on a lighter note but, but but i think i think i think what is critical here is that as, as a practitioner you have got a duty and what is very critical colleagues that's why i'll take you back to the issue of also of naming practices why do we want you to name your practice after your name that's why it it is against our ethical rules to just write physiotherapist out there Mm -hmm. or occupational therapist or psych clinical psychologist, for example, without your name. Because patients are not coming to the building. 
patients are coming to a particular practitioner, and if they were coming to you, Dion, they may not want to go to Lani. Don't force them to go to Lani. No. That's why if you are selling your practice, you need to inform your patient that in time that I will be moving from this place to somewhere else. I'll be selling my practice. I want to know from you if uh, you want to stay here. Uh, this is the person who's going to be practicing here. It's another physiotherapist. And you, if you can know their name, you can even tell them, this is the person. Do you want me to give you your no clinical information? Or you want it to stay here and you can still come and consult with this person? Yeah. That is what you need to do. Just disappearing without your patients knowing that will be abandonment of your patients. You need to make arrangements and they need to know which arrangements you have made and it will remain up to them to decide if they want to stay in that practice with another practitioner. Maybe they love the couches, mm -hmm. not necessarily love you. They love the couches that they sit on and what they do in the practice. And they may not mind to come back even if there's another practitioner. But they may say, you know what, I, I came here because of you and I will want to go to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Dr. Quinder, you've opened up a bit of a can of worms relating to the naming of practice. There is a question out there, and, and I think the regulation has been uh, most certainly clarified and directed as far as using your name and surname, initials and surname, that if you do use your, your, your um, discipline type like physiotherapy, that you use physiotherapist rather than physiotherapy. Um, and I think there's been some good clarity on that one. But there's, there's a question to say, what about those practices that are incorrectly named as they stand right now? And they might be rehab rocks and uh, you're going, hang on, you know, that's not ethically appropriate. What, what, what do they do about that? Have they got uh, exemption uh, to do that? Or? <laughs> Dion, there's no exemption. Uh, <laughs> the issue is, uh, the issue really is uh, we, we have not been good in enforcement mm -hmm. uh, from our side. You know, in 2015, we established our inspectorate and, and they've been more on reactive I inspections, not proactive inspections. We had discussions recently where we want to increase our inspector rate, but we don't want to do that at the expense of the practitioners. Mm. But the, the same staff who have been working for the HPCSA to beef up the inspector rate because that is one area where we really need to come in. Not yeah. only naming of practices, Dion, but also even information on your professional stationery. I always say practitioners don't even put their registration number with the HPCSA, but your practice number from BHF, hey, you put it there because you know it means food on the table. But you can't have that practice number if you don't have a registration number with the HPCSA. Yeah. And if on your stationery you don't have your registration number with the HPCSA, then you are contravening the ethical rules. So it's the issue of enforcement, Dion, which is a really uh, uh, for now reactive but when we become proactive then uh, we are even moving uh, by the way to, 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 to reviewing our legislation where you will get also a compliance notices and being given some time to comply with the ethical rules so basically those who are doing it there's no permission from the HPCSA it is just an issue that uh, we have not been good in enforcing the ethical rules. But let me also mention Dion while we are here, yeah. that we also have got a challenge, which, you know, I don't know, we, we and uh, maybe that employee is here, you should think about it. The issue of naming your practice uh, in terms of vernacular uh, languages, is easy in English, you know, physiotherapist, maybe even in Afrikaans. Okay. But who is a physiotherapist in Chivenda, mm. or Zulu, or Tswana? How do you call yourself? I mean, I have seen dental therapists calling themselves, you know, and when a patient goes there, even physiotherapists will call themselves, that is an orthopedic surgeon. Yes. And, and it's because in our vernacular, we don't necessarily have yes. The, yes. The, the naming of these uh, professions, you know. Mm -hmm. It's there in English, but in really in vernacular, everyone then becomes a doctor. And for an ordinary member of the public, that can be confusing. I understand. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very, very interesting. <laughs> Dion, did you want to add anything else or answer mm -hmm. any questions that you spotted? 
Yeah, I'm just interested, uh, Dr. Kondi, you say there is regulation you're looking at. Does that tie into the licensure uh, to practice reviews and, and the management of that? And is there possibly an update just relate, relating to the, the, the license to practice elements? It, in, in fact, what I'm talking about is the overrolling of the whole Health Professions Act. Okay. We are at a policy making stage with consultations currently with the professional boards before we can go and consult with yourselves because we will be contacting all the professional associations mm -hmm. uh, in, in consultation of, of that policy document. And those are some of the things that we, we are looking at. Right. Okay. And, and if I may, the, the, the progress on the license to practice, is that, is that uh, enacted? Is that in process? Where, where are we over there? Yeah, it's in process. Uh, there are two boards. We have the, we had three boards in the beginning that were being piloted, but one, which I won't mention the name, has withdrawn okay. uh, from that participation. <laughs> and we are remaining with two boards. I think it's, uh, uh, there were three boards. Let me mention them. We had the Medical and Dental Professions Board, the Occupational Therapy, you know, OCP, we call it OCP. Uh, the name is quite too long. Uh, Arts Therapy, Orthotics, uh, and so on and then also the medical uh, technology board. Uh, okay. They were the boards that were being piloted on, but okay. the MDB has withdrawn and we have got those two. So the project is continuing okay. uh, of, of the uh, maintenance of licensure to practice, but we are also embarking on the overrolling of the whole Health Professions Act. Okay. So to a point where this current act will be repealed and a new act uh, will be enacted. Okay, all right. Very interesting. You. you did mention that your colleague Mpo is on the call with us today. I know he can't talk, but he's in attendance. Um, a request that came through via the previous webinar is to share some of the contact details of the HPCSA. I know Dion did before we even started with the webinar. In the chat functionality, if you scroll all the way up to the top, he did include it in there. There's two email addresses that we did share with you. The one is professional practice at hbcsa.co.za. And the other one is mpo mb at hbcsa.co.za. Dr. Kunda, do I M. Po, mpo m. Is it mpo m or mpo m? Just mpo m, yes. Okay. Dion, perhaps you can just correct that for us if you don't mind. So it's professional practice at hbcsa.co.za. Maybe, I mean, he, he typed something there, Lani. It, it seemingly is in poor MB. Um, I may be the one who is wrong, but it seems like uh, it's in poor MB. MB. We may be having lots of imports. <laughs> yeah, we, no, I think, I think it's in poor MB. I, 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 he typed MB. it himself. So you are, you are correct to say in poor MB. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And if you use those two email address, addresses, your, your query or your question should be answered fairly quickly by the HPCSA or the correct team at least. Perfect, let's crack on. And I wanna start addressing another question that was asked on another topic of conversation. And it's at the moment the talk of the town and that is telehealth. Now, before we go to the questions, I'm gonna try and recap what you said, Dr. Quinn, and I'm not gonna try and take the words out of your mouth. So please interrupt me if, I'm, if I get this wrong. But two weeks ago, that you, you, you did say that you were the author of the telehealth guidelines. It's obviously, we know it's been reviewed. It's been circulated. Telemedicine changed to telehealth. We also know that both known as well as new patients can now use the telehealth platform with their healthcare practitioner if it is appropriate. You also did mention that you, together with the council, are actively following what is happening globally, sort of around the world and observing how technology can, can benefit both patients and healthcare practitioners, especially on a telehealth platform. Mm -hmm. And that post COVID, you will strongly consider to continue the support of telehealth. Can I just double check with you, is that still your view? But by the way, Lani, uh, not necessarily my view, uh, as I said last time, we have a committee of council yes. uh, that, 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 that provide this guidance, uh, which is called the Human Rights Ethics and Practice Committee. It's a committee of council, and this committee does what uh, Section 49 of our Act says mm -hmm. uh, on behalf of council, making rules 
uh, in terms of that particular section in consultation with the professional boards. So this committee has shown a desire to relook look at the telemedicine guidelines. As I said last time, uh, the, the, when we put together the telemedicine guidelines, they were based on us supporting the policy, the policy directives of the Department of Health. And, and those policy directives were talking about increasing access to patients who are in remote areas to also have access to specialized care uh, from a remote area. That, that was the basic thing. Now, with advancement of technology, uh, of course, the council need to relook really at that and say, can't we open certain things so that at least we can also increase accessibility? Because basically those ones, let's be honest, they were more geared to the public sector and looking at how can also this be used in the private sector. That is where you start to open it up. But I think that, that commitment was there from the HRP, the, the committee I referred to earlier, to look at that. Of course, we will have to drive it from, from secretariat uh, under my leadership and Paul is here, is the one who ran with these things and, 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 and present before the committee and, and see how we take it forward. From the committee, then it goes to the boards. And let me say that it's not all the boards who support telehealth. Let me be honest with you. Some of the boards feel that it's not relevant for them because of the nature of the profession. So, so it has to be consulted with all the 12 professional boards and, and, and see how, how, how we move forward. You will know that even with our ethical rules, we do have annexures in the ethical rules. And annexures are more board specific. They are specific for that particular profession. So you may find that even when we do that, we may have annexures because certain professions may say, we can only allow you on this, but this you can't do on telehealth. Yeah. Okay, okay. Dion, your thoughts around that? I know you've got a fairly strong opinion about telehealth. Yeah, look, I think the, there are... Um there, there are there are the, the disciplines that we that we generally classifying. I think some of the administrators are classifying as consulting disciplines. Um, if you look at psychology, dietitian, social work, and so on, and um, I think those are almost the obvious ones where uh, telehealth engagements are are appropriate. Uh, they're an enabler. Um, I certainly don't think that this is such a new fad that it will replace healthcare as it currently stands. Of course, it's an additional tool to complement your engagements with your patients to follow up with patients, to plan your treatments with patients, um, uh, to schedule whether they need to come in or not, or can it be something that you can give advice remotely on. Um, so I think it's an incredible tool. Um, I think the, the, the bold step in, in moving and saying uh, telemedicine is not just the link between a consulting practitioner and a servicing practitioner, but actually between the actual treating provider and the patient directly is really a phenomenal move. And it's a uh, Obviously, there's been uh, uh, additional reasons why that has been required being COVID. Um, but I do think COVID is a catalyst in many of us adopting technologies and doing things differently and realizing Absolutely. that, hang on, this is actually not so bad. Um, I mean, I'm so encouraged by the variation of, 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 of generations and age, both on patients and practitioners who are adopting new technology all the time. Um, so I think it's exciting. Um, I think we must uh, caution against uh, and, and just ensure that we're using telehealth responsibly. Um, obviously, the HBCSA is watching carefully, um, as the regulator should, and is concerned about things like over-servicing, supersession, and so on. And I think as healthcare practitioners, we need to use this technology in a responsible way, in an appropriate way. And I think that would open up the opportunities to continue to do so. But obviously, abuse of this kind of platform won't be tolerated by by the HPCSA primarily, but I think the, you're going to find uh, uh, other role parties getting involved as well, which um, uh, which which is which is a concern. So um, when when one talks about the more physical disciplines, if you talk about um, uh, podiatry, for example, uh, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, um, I think I think it would be um, it, it it would be an injustice to just jump in and say, but that's a physical discipline. So then, I, surely I can't do telehealth uh, consultations there. Uh, we've seen. Um, uh, practitioners who are quite uh, uh, front-footed in new ways of engaging with their patients, adopting telehealth even in the physical. Now, you're not going to be able to do massage telehealth. I mean, that's an obvious one. But we do more than that. What about reaching out, checking on the patient? How are they? Do they need to come back for a review? Um, uh, ensuring that, they, that, that they're integrated well at home in the workplace. Um, 
uh, reassessing uh, to determine prior to them coming in rather than them coming in all the way and say, you know what, actually you're fine. And it's a two minute consultation. That, that, that's not an efficient way of managing. So, but also ensuring that where face-to-face -face consultations are required, of course, you're encouraging the patient to come in. It's not a replacement for where that's appropriate. No, no, spot on. And I can't agree with you more, actually. I want to go back to two weeks ago when we had our first webinar with Dr. Quindan. One of the questions that came up there and numerous times afterwards is a, an example where a healthcare practitioner is based overseas, they live overseas, the patient is still in South Africa. Can they do telehealth and where should the healthcare practitioner be registered? Yeah, very, very interesting one, uh, Lani. Th that, that's why the, the first thing really that we need to think of is yeah. the best interest of the patient. Mm. Of course, when you practice your profession, you don't practice your profession in the air. You practice the profession. Uh, that's why sometimes people say, hey, what happens when we are flying now and we are in, in this car? <laughs> that is an, another scenario. Of course, it's what a reasonable person will do under the circumstances, but you are either uh, in South Africa or outside South Africa, and your patient is either in South Africa or wherever you are. Mm. And that's why what has always been emphasized is that at least you should be registered with both juristic uh, authorities from both sides. But really in the main, and, and these are realities, uh, if if you are a psychologist and you had your patient and now you went abroad and you need to consult with your patient and your patient is fine with it, they say, you know what, I, I, I will want to continue with you from, uh, from that side because uh, we can be able to, 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 to communicate uh, through telehealth. Then th th that can be done. At the end of the day, is are you acting in the best interest of your patient, or you are saying, "I'm moving abroad and I don't want to lose my patients, even though I'm not in South Africa. I want to continue seeing you. I continue claiming like as if I'm in South Africa." And it also depends on the kind of a profession that you have. The question is, should you need to see that patient physically? Will you be able to? And that becomes critical. That's why in the main, in all these things, colleagues, is are you doing that in the best interest of your patient or your own best interest? So that should be a standard that we need to use. Is the patient benefiting from this? Absolutely. I, I like that. I like that. And I think we've, we've covered this question more than once now, so hopefully we can, we can put that to bed. Mm -hmm. Something that hasn't come up, and I think we need to address this, is a a recent article that was actually published where quite a few groups of doctors, whether it's different forums or associations came together and they started approaching medical schemes because the doctors felt because of COVID and the impact that it had on their practices that they are completely out of pocket and some of them are just not getting remunerated at all for medical schemes. So that a proposal to medical schemes was, please pay us a salary or, a, or remunerate us on a monthly basis, exactly the same amount as what you paid us last year, so back in 2019. And they also proposed you can pay us 2019 rates, just so that them as the doctor or the healthcare professional in this case actually makes an income, because some of their practices are completely closed down because there are zero patients. Now, there's obviously a lot of questions around the statement and definitely around the article. Is it ethical, first of all, to ask the question? Are you also allowed to be remunerated for services you have not provided yet? I see you someone sitting back in your chair. Is this a, is this a... <laughs> <laughs> Lani, this, this, this uh, is a difficult one. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Lani, we, we have got a reality. And it's not only the 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 the, the COVID-19 pandemic is not only affecting health professionals. I mean, everyone involved in a particular business is affected. Whether you are involved in the business of selling liquor, or you are involved in the business of doing events, where now people can get married, they can have parties. Sure. Everyone is affected, and health professionals as well. Now, that's why we do have uh, uh, rules. Uh, health professionals have got standards that they need to uphold. And, and 
the issue is very clear. I do not know from the schemes, of course, I'm not a fundi of the, of the Medical Schemes Act and the regulations thereof, whether the schemes are allowed to pay a service provider while they've not rendered a service to a member. But what I know from our side is that you cannot claim for services not rendered. We, we are not operating in a cap capitation model mm. unless there are those practitioners who are operating. I, I know it's fee for service, meaning that you render a service and you, you claim for the services that you have rendered. Of course, we, last time you remember we spoke about alternative reimbursement models and capitation is one of them. You know. mm diagnostic related groups, DRGs, one of them, depending on where you are operating, fee for service is still one of them. But mm. as we are right now, you cannot claim for services not rendered. That is where we are as the HPCSA. So, so that's why I said back, I thought, yeah, it's a dire situation we do understand, but, but really uh, going to that extent, uh, because uh, let's be honest, uh, uh, Lani, <laughs> Colleagues are affected, especially those who are in disciplines, especially surgical disciplines, and that also includes physiotherapists and so on. I mean, if people are not having accidents because they are not drinking and there's no yeah. violence and so on, it means they are not going to break their legs and go to the orthopedic surgeons and for you, and uh, they don't need physio. So it's, we are all going to be affected, yeah. and that it's is the reality. Knock on effect. Knock <laughs> yeah. on effect on everyone. So, so, I mean, ethically, of course, I will speak specifically in terms of our ethical rules. Of course, that is unethical. Mm. Dr. Quinda, I think... Um, one of the elements that come to mind as soon as those, those proposals are put forward is we understand that people are under financial pressure. And when one looks for financial relief, there's various places to do that, uh, through the government, through the UIF tourist programs where appropriate. Um, uh, uh, various corporate uh, uh, bodies and individuals have put money forward to help and support practices and, and businesses. Um, and, and there's bank loans, all sorts of ways of raising capital to try and assist. I think throwing medical schemes and administrators into that mix is interesting. I mean, it's another third party that you can possibly call to. But I think the caution for me would be, um, we need to understand any form of corporate involvement or co potential corporate interference in the practitioner uh, uh, autonomy and the relationship with the patient. And um, if I took a bank loan from a practice, if I took a bank loan for my practice, and the I've got terms about financial payback, but there's not terms around how I treat, what I bill, what rates I bill, mm -hmm. and so on. And I think if anybody does engage with any of those sorts of agreements, I just really caution to read the fine print, read the terms and conditions of that, and ensure that you're maintaining your autonomy, that you are able to manage your practices, your patients in your practice as appropriately as you deem necessary from a clinical perspective, and that that, not is, that is not swayed through any sort of corporate entity that is interfering in that decision-making and that treatment process, whether it's your bank manager, whether it's your rich uncle, or whether it's a, a medical scheme. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely, brilliant. I'm gonna move on from that topic because I'm watching the clock as well and there's still a few things that we need to cover. Um, Dr. Quinda, the question around road shows came up and I think it was actually in the, in the chat section as well. Is it happening, is it not hap is it happening? Is it happening in a webinar, a Zoom session? How can people engage with you? Mpo, Mpo is supposed to be presenting this week. I think it's happening this evening at six, if I'm not mistaken, the very first one online. We are starting today, uh, I think it's today, yeah, I think it's tonight, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so they are starting this week, uh, our online uh, uh, symposium Excellent. on tips. Yeah. If so people need we, to, to we, register we, for that, do they just go to your website? I, I, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure. Maybe I, I will, I will not... in the chat for us. Some <laughs> yeah, <more>? Maybe you <laughs> can help us on the, on the <laughs> chat there, but I know, I know that our, our corporate affairs uh, division has started that and the, we are kickstarting them this week. Uh, so I don't know, the, check on our website or because this one, you don't have to, we don't, we don't have to send only to those in that particular town. So it, it has to be on our website so that at least anyone can attend. I think uh, depending on uh, the number that we can take on, on teams, uh, of course there will be that limitation. 
Perfect, perfect. And Paul, if you are still on the call with us this afternoon, perhaps you can just dot us an answer. I think there we go. One starting today on Teams platform, and we will have them at least every two weeks going forward. Wonderful. I think that is really good news because we have quite a few queries around that. I do think people want to engage with the HPCSA, but it can't happen in a physical environment. So let's go the digital route. It works. We can see it. We've got how many people online with us this afternoon? Close to 550. Yeah. So <laughs> it works. We know it is amazing. So let's use the technology that, that we've got in front of us. Uh, so gentlemen, another question that keeps coming up, and that's the topic around uh, and regarding billing and billing policies. Should a healthcare provider who's in a private practice use medical scheme rates? Can they determine their own practice rates? How should they determine their own practice rates? And there's often this term that gets used on um, upper ethical tariffs. Now, <laughs> It's, it's a bit of a contentious one, but perhaps you could just give us your input, your thoughts around this. And then Dion, I think I need to ask you as well. So for Dr. Quinnell, let's perhaps start with you. You know, I, I, I always say uh, there's no one who, re, who can regulate how much a practitioner can charge. Or let me say who can determine how much a practitioner is supposed to charge. How much you charge is dependent on the cost for running your practice. And the cost for running your practice include your professional fee as a person. It includes, you know, your, your staff that works for you and the systems that you are using in your practice or the machines and everything. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say, you know, for certain practitioners, like for example, it's difficult to set up an optometry practice or even a dental practice compared to setting up a medical practice because mm -hmm. uh, just to take it too far, for me to set up a medical practice, I just need a stethoscope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the rest can fall. <laughs> but for you to examine the eyes, you need lots of equipment that is expensive. Yeah. yeah. And where, where you are practicing from also is a determinant. I mean, mm -hmm. If you are practicing in a mall, things are not easy like they are in downtown and so on. So at the end of the day, you set your fees in line with the running costs for your practice. <laughs> then you inform your patients about the costs of the services that you're gonna render to them. And after that, you issue them with a statement of account. Mm -hmm. I always say those are the two basic things that you need to do inform your patient about the cost of services before rendering the service and issue the patient with a statement of account afterwards, then you are done. And we always advise that, you know, if possible, where possible, uh, make them sign uh, that info, for that information because really on our side, when we adjudicate on these matters, the question we ask ourselves, did you inform the patient? Can you prove that you inform the patient? And if you produce that proof, we even allow you, because most of the patients come to us when you take them to the debt collectors. Then they run to us and we say, no, 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 just pay. If their debt collection fees are charged, pay because the practitioner has fulfilled his duty or her duty. Mm -hmm. You were informed, you signed for it, you received a statement of account, you ignored it, and only now that the lawyers are after you or the debt collectors are after you, you are running to us. The practitioner has fulfilled their duty, fulfill yours, because the service has been rendered. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And um, from the HPCSA point of view, do you perhaps have any documentation that might help some of the healthcare professionals, a consent form of such that they can use in their practices? We, we did uh, publish this, uh, I think, two or three years back. Uh, I I promised Dion that I will share this with him. I just forgot. <laughs> we, we 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 did publish a guide uh, which which really, if if we make it available in Word, a practitioner can just put it on his or her letterhead, and it's quite very simple and straightforward uh, for somebody to use. So we do have such a. A, 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 a document which we had published before for practitioners. Mm -hmm. So we will make it available to you to share with anyone. And we'll also, I think Paul will ensure that it is also on our website so that mm -hmm. colleagues can have access to. On our new 
uh, website, uh, Oracle right. Service Cloud. I think we can put that very soon. As soon as Monday, it can be there. And if you just go there on frequently asked questions mm -hmm. on our knowledge base, we just type cost estimate, then you should be able to pick it up. It should come up and then you can be able to download it for yourself. Wonderful. But Leon, am I correct when I'm saying there's more than one type of consent form that should be in place? Yeah, I, th I think we, we always advise that there's um, there's potentially three. Um, I think the, the first one is your informed clinical consent, and I use those words very specifically. It's informed. In other words, the patients are told up front, they've got opportunity to ask questions and engage, and then through an informed process, then decide whether they're consenting to a certain clinical intervention or, or procedure. Okay. So it's an informed clinical consent, and that's between clinician and practitioner and a patient. And then you've got to inform financial consent, which is your, which Dr. Kunda is speaking to now about uh, contracting with the patient on the terms relating to your rates for the practice. Um, and then the process as well. Are you paying up front and then claiming back from your medical scheme? I'll submit it to your medical scheme. There's mm -hmm. going to be a shortfall or a difference, whatever the case might be. Uh, we'll unpack a little bit more about that next week. Um, I think you'll speak a little bit about that now, but I'm seeing a lot of questions around um, uh, billing. Um, and we've got uh, issues like, uh, what, what is your rate? How do you determine that? Uh, we'll unpack that in a practical way, just to just to run through. How do I actually determine the rate of my practice, Good. and what should I be charging? Um, there's also other questions that have come up in the feeds here that I just want to quickly play back and uh, just maybe sure. wet people's appetite. We'll be talking about uh, levies and co-payments. Can I charge that? What does that look like? Uh, balance billing versus split billing. Charging for written reports. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, <laughs> paying ahead. Paying ahead for fees. Um, I've heard practitioners that, um, that that patients want to pay like almost a subscription. I'll pay for the month and then I know I've got like eight sessions available for me. So we'll unpack a lot of that because I think that's that's enough uh, to, to fill a full webinar uh, our session. But then also just not to forget the third uh, consent is obviously telehealth consent. If you are going to engage with your patients on a telehealth platform, make sure that you've either included the telehealth clauses in your informed consents elsewhere, like your informed clinical consent, but I would advise Mm -hmm. that you consider a dedicated telehealth consent form because it has its own terms and conditions related to that and we have made that available as well if anyone does uh, does have a need for that wonderful i'm glad you put your hand up i did see it i did see it that you're going <laughs> to be part of next week's webinar and you're really going to unpack this more because i know you're extremely knowledgeable you've got a lot of experience and i'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions around this which you can answer so dion thank you very much for that anyone interested again same time same place next week thursday at four o'clock, just register on the web webinar tab on the website easymet.solutions. But guys, before we say goodbye, I, I do want to ask you to answer one or two polling questions. Um, I'm going to start with the first one. It's literally just to gauge um, your interest in the type of webinar that we're doing. Are, are you enjoying it? Um, this is a specific question relating to have you used the HPCSA new online portal to renew your annual registration? Dr. Kunda asked us to post this one specifically. I'll just give you a few seconds to answer this. We do appreciate you taking the time to just give us a bit of feedback. This also helps us position following webinars and following topics as well. I'm going to give it 10 more seconds. Perfect. I'm going to end this poll. We've got about 75% of people that answered. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate that. Um, the second one is an easy one. It's a 1 to 10, where 10 is absolutely fantastic. You love today's webinar. You found it valuable. You found it interesting. Zero is not at all not interested. So if you can, perhaps just quickly note down 10 down to one. Um, as, we're giving people, <laughs> as we're giving people a chance just to answer that, Lonnie, if I might uh, just, just add in here, we're seeing a lot of thank you for an informative session. Thank you everyone for your encouraging words. Um, we do undertake to continue these every Thursday. I'm going to reiterate what Lonnie has said. Every, every Thursday at four o'clock, make it a standing uh, a date. Um, and then those who are interested in uh, some of these topics have been covered in previous webinars. We've got, I think, eight previous webinars that are all recorded and on the website. So just go to past webinars. Also, easymed.solutions, go to the webinars tab. And if you scroll down to the past webinars, you'll see the titles and the links to the actual uh, recordings. You can also find it on YouTube as well. If you just search for EasyMed, um, you'll find those there. So please go and have a look at those. They, they really do. Uh, they they they're jam-packed with some, some excellent information and some great interactions. 
Thank you, Dion. Um, I'm going to post the last polling question. It's a very quick one, just a yes, no. Would you attend more webinars similar to this one? Actually wanted to know whether we can get Dr. Kunda back again in a few weeks time. Um, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> so just a quick yes, no from you. Um, it looks very promising. Dr. Kunda, I think we've, we've got you down for another <laughs> session. <laughs> Lani, we, all, all, all the time. I mean, we, we really enjoy interacting with practitioners. And in fact, I will just love a, a webinar where we just talk about the HPCSA and answer those questions like, uh, why are annual fees for this group higher than this one? And so on, you know, so that we can just bring it clear to practitioners. So how do we determine these annual fees? What processes do we follow? What is, does it mean when we do this? Just talk about the HPCSA. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much for your willingness to, to join us again. Um, just lastly, please remember if there is anyone attending today and you are still interested to try Medici, which is the secure telehealth platform, either with or without EasyMed, which is your practice management solution, which by the way, has got a fantastic billing policy functionality, which Dion will discuss next week. If you want to try either of these products, um, they are available to you completely for free until the end of July. It, the time is running out, so do get on there, have a play around, see whether you enjoy them, see whether your patients can benefit from them as well. It is offered to you absolutely for free until the end of July. That's all from my side. Dr. Quinda, maybe just one last sentence from your side, Dion from your side as well, and then we'll wrap it up. No, for me really is just to thank you so much for, for availing this opportunity. For, for us as council to interact with practitioners. We always love to be available for practitioners to guide uh, uh, colleagues in the practice of our profession. So creating this platform and inviting us really means a lot. And that's why we'll always be available whenever you need us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dion, a last thought from you. Thank you, Lonnie. Uh, I think just uh, to Dr. Quinda, thank you very much again for your time. We really do appreciate your, your contributions and for being here. And, and, I, and I've really been encouraged by the HPCSA's a strong move into guiding professionals. Um, I think uh, I, still, I still have people coming to me saying, hang on a second, what's the HPCSA doing for me? And, you know, you really have to be participating in events like this, going to the roadshows, and you can see the fruits of, of the guidance to practitioners. The size of it's directed. It's not just referring to some legalese that us practitioners struggle to understand and we have to interpret it. There's clear direction and, and we really do appreciate that from the HPCSA. Um, and then uh, I know Lonnie introduced you in reverse order of priority. I know that for you, your, your priority in calling is, is, is pastorship and, uh, and I look forward to seeing you on Sunday on, on, the, on your, on your <laughs> Yes. Uh, see, see, you see you, the honest the, the congregant on Sunday. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so I, much. I enjoyed Thank listening you. about Joseph last week, Sandra. I did listen. <laughs> wow, wow, Lani. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Quinda, I know you've got a long road ahead tonight. You need to start traveling to be safe and reach your destination. Thanks again for joining us, Dion. You too. I think Thank that's you so much, Lani. Attendees, thanks for joining us again. Stay warm, stay healthy, and we'll see you next Thursday. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.